Good morning. Good to see you guys. So this might surprise you, but um, I don't always or even often get immediate feedback from a sermon. Every once in a while I hear something that the Lord does, but last Sunday was an exception. I think within about 24 hours, I heard somewhere between half a dozen and a dozen different stories of how as we talked about the way that we carry anger or resentment into relationships that God was prompting people to respond like immediately. And it was beautiful. And I think that was so effective because, you know, Jesus um, is very, uh, he's very precise in how he deals with us. And he's going to continue that work today in Matthew chapter five, as he continues to sort of cause us to interact with the ways that we see other people. We all have ways of seeing people. Some of those ways are healthy and probably honor the Lord. Some of those ways are not healthy and don't honor the Lord. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, again, is reminding us of how to live in every area of life. And what he's going to say to us is challenging. He's not inviting us to live a life apart from his power and apart from dependence upon him, but rather a life in dependence upon what he calls us to do. And again, you hear this refrain, um, it has been said to you of old, and, but I say to you, all of that is Jesus' way of sort of attacking and addressing the cultural norms of the day. And so as he, tra- he transitions from anger, how we see people through an angry lens, to now telling us what he believes about love and sex. And here Jesus is warning us about our sexual appetites, and he's challenging the way that we see other people and the way that we see other people as um, as sexual beings, and so we just need to come. We, we need to come to terms with the fact that for most of us, our views about sexuality is shaped way more by Sigmund Freud than Jesus. Right. So psychology has impacted us in profound ways in terms of how we think about sex and sexuality. Um, because of Freud and the many things that we've heard and learned, we've come to view lust specifically as very normal. Um, and very healthy, and, and here's the important one, as uncontrollable. Like it's a force that's greater than our ability to resist it, and Jesus is going to press against that. Now, when you think about what the world says about sex and sexuality, um, the world says that sex is really about three things. Um, One is that that, that sex is about pleasure. So um, that that sex is about making me feel good. Now, here's the great thing about the Bible. The Bible also says that pleasure is good in this arena, but it says that it's designed for, for sex is designed for pleasure, but also more than that. The world also says that sex is about our identity. Um, it defines who I am, right? And where this is in collision with the Bible and with Scripture and Jesus is that Jesus would tell us is that our, our true identity can only come from our Creator. And then lastly, the world tells us that sex is about, it's a need, um, that it's actually necessary to flourish. Um, and if we don't express ourselves um, the ways that we want to express ourselves sexually, that we're not going to live a flourishing life, which is so interesting because the, the person who lived the fullest, 
and most flourishing life ever, Jesus, um, was not a sexually active man when he walked the earth. So um, you see this tension and how these things are sort of colliding with one another. And Jesus is specifically, as we jump into Matthew 5, and you're going to know, most of you are going to know this verse, he's going to challenge the way that we view other people and their bodies, and we also view our own. Now, as I read the text in a few minutes, a surface reading will probably lead you to believe that Jesus is a bit of a prude, that he has a very negative view on sex and sexuality. Um, But far from that, he has a very beautiful and compelling view if we understand it rightly. He is inviting us to look beyond those three things, pleasure, identity, and need to the truest purposes of sex, love, and marriage. He wants us to move from an attitude of using people to treasuring people. And you'll see exactly what Jesus means in just a few minutes. So here's our big idea. It's the same big idea that we had last week because the goal is the same. Following Jesus brings alignment between our inner life and our outward actions. So for a lot of religious people, um, there's, there's a lot of disconnect, right? We do, all, we do the right things outwardly, but we don't do it with the right motivation, right? So if I do the right thing outwardly with, with the wrong inner motivation, that's, that is works righteousness. That's me trying to earn something, right? Jesus wants there to be alignment between what's happening internally in me and what comes out of me as I interact with the world that he's created. So Matthew chapter 5, let's pick up in verse 27. You have heard it that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. It was also said... Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. It might be, if you read the Bible, especially the New Testament, it might be that in the arena of sex and sexuality, that 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 is what most shocked the, the Greco-Roman world. As the gospel was spreading throughout the world, um, this would be the thing that really would have gotten their attention. And that's because um, before the influence of Christianity, especially in the Roman world, it was a very dark and dangerous place, especially for women. Uh, the prevailing culture in which Jesus begins to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, and this was true in Rome and also in uh, Galilee and Israel, um, was that, that people outside of the kingdom of God did not ascribe value, worth, and dignity to all people. That wasn't a universal axiom. It wasn't something that everybody necessarily believed. As a matter of fact, uh, in the Roman world, consensual recreational sex for men and forced sex for women and those of lower value was protected by law. It was just to be expected. And it wasn't that dark in Jesus's world as a Jew, but even in Jesus's culture, Jewish women were, were very, very, very vulnerable. Men could divorce their wives for almost any reason. Um, it's the same as it is today. We have no fault divorce. People are like, hey, this isn't working out. Uh, this person is not who I thought they were going to be. And I'm out. I'm checking out of this relationship. The difference is, is, is in Jesus's world, it would have been very, very difficult for a woman to survive if she was divorced. And Jesus That's the context for these words, right? So you need to understand that. That's the context for these words. And what we learn is, is that Jesus, just like we do, he lived in a world where people were treated as objects and commodities. He lived in a world where people didn't necessarily value people as made in the image of God. So I've titled this message, From Using to Treasuring. From Using to Treasuring. And that's gonna be our outline this morning. So let's begin with from using. Again, Jesus' words, Matthew verse 27, it says this, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. So again, Jesus is talking about the institution of marriage here. Verse 28, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, one of the first things that's right here on the surface is is that Jesus, again, also lived in an age of objectification. That's a big word at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. Some of you are like, hey, it's summertime. I'm not thinking right now. Um, So here's the definition. To objectify someone is to use them to meet your needs. So objectifying a person is to use that person to meet your needs. It is a consumeristic view of a relationship. It is a 
what can I get out of this relationship point of view? It is treating others not as a person, but as a thing. Treating someone as an object and at the same time, not accounting for their autonomy or their needs or their feelings. So now when I say it that way, you all understand that objectifying someone is a very selfish way to look at a relationship, right? And yet most of us, because we live in a consumeristic culture, to objectify a person comes pretty second nature to us. Um, we enter into most spaces wondering, what am I going to get out of this? Does that make sense? So some of you actually came to church today and you will, you will make a statement either subconsciously or consciously after church or after lunch and you'll say something like this, I didn't get anything out of the sermon today. As if the point of you being here was to get something out of a sermon. You do know that, right? The point of being here has nothing to do with me. Because we're here, we're gathered here to worship the name of Jesus, right? But we do that with church. We do it with our job. We do it with all kinds of relationships. Some of you, some of you look at certain relationships and you're like, I don't want to be in relationship with that person, even though God's brought them in my life, because I don't think I'm going to get anything out of that relationship. All of these things point to the thing that Jesus is pushing against here. He wants us to, to, to pursue different kinds of relationships with people rather than objectif objectifying relationships or consumeristic relationships. So here's the mentality in a consumeristic relationship. Here's the mentality. Um, you adjust to me. You give me what I want or I'm out. The relationship no longer has value to you, right? If you have a consumeristic mentality where you objectify people. Now, how does Jesus sort of redirect us? He says, you shall not commit adultery. Now, the fact that he's talking about adultery means that he is pointing to what? Marriage, right? He's talking about marriage. He's talking about this, this thing that violates or breaks marriage. Now, there's really no way of getting around this. There's all kinds of chatter in our culture about what Jesus does say or doesn't say about sex and sexuality. And the, the thing that's so interesting to me is that Jesus is actually pretty clear. You can't really get around what he's saying. Jesus advocates for sex only within a marriage covenant. It's the whole reason he's pointing back to the cultural norm. You've heard it, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, which is what? which is an attack, it undermines the marriage covenant, right? It's a destruction of the marriage covenant. It's a disruption of it. It's a rupture of it. So, so Jesus wants us to understand, and also adultery is the act of sex outside of that covenant. So Jesus is being really plain. We can try to navigate around this all we want, or what does Jesus say? What does Paul say? Blah, blah, blah. Jesus, here's Jesus' words. I'm telling you, he advocates for sex only within a marriage relationship. He, he believes that marriage is God's idea, that it must not be betrayed. And because he's talking about not breaking it, he's telling us something important, that marriage is not just a commitment. Marriage is a word that we don't use very much, but it's a covenant. What's a covenant? It's a promise. So a promise should be more binding than your signature on a marriage license in the state of North Carolina. The promise before God, right? Because a lot of, when you're Christians, we get married before God, right? We want to... Right? The promise is more binding than the signature on the marriage license. So even if that signature was scrubbed off, but you made this promise before God, are you still married? It just got so uncomfortable in here. It only gets worse. And so the promise is more binding than the legal document. It's also more binding than the emotional feelings, right? The promise is actually what carries us through when you wake up and you're like, I don't know that I want to be married today. Now, I know no one in here has ever had that thought before. You're all happily married. It's, all, it's been great the whole time that you've been married. Just You can teach our next marriage conference. We're so excited. Thank you. <laughs> now, the idea of covenant is meant to create safety for us, right? So if a consumeristic, objectified relationship says, you adjust to me or I'm out of here, a covenant relationship says this, I adjust to you and I'm here to stay. You feel the difference, right? It's like, I see you, I value you. I'm gonna make adjustments 
to you. And here's what's implied in that statement. And if you don't adjust to me in all the ways that I want you to adjust to me, I'm still going to be here. I'm not going anywhere because I've promised to live in relationship with you. I want this to be a place of safety. I want this to be a place where you can be yourself. I want this to be a place where you no longer have to earn acceptance. You don't have to perform. You don't have to jump through hoops because I've, I've promised myself to you. I've pledged myself to you before the Lord. Now that, that all feels great when we feel love for one another, right? It's, it's not always easy, but it's like, I can do this when I feel affection for the person. It gets difficult when you don't feel it, which is why the promise is important, right? Because you don't always feel it at the same level. Tim Keller gives some helpful wisdom here when he says this. He says, when you commit to a person in spite of your feelings, deeper feelings grow. Now, some of you are in a hard spot and maybe in marriage, and you're like, I don't think that's true. <laughs> I get it. So let's use a different, this is just a different example. Think about parenting. Some of you have raised your kids. Some of you are raising your kids right now. Some of you hope to raise kids one day. And I'm about to sort of um, burst your bubble about what it's going to be like. When you parent a child, when you raise that little child, that little energy vampire, and it grows into more of an adult, you get very little back in terms of what you invest into that child. Does that make sense? And here's the thing. Your commitment to that child grows even though they aren't giving back equal investments into your life. Now I'm told eventually it comes full circle. I don't know if that's true or not. We'll see. We'll find out. One of my kids is here today, so... Maybe she'll remember this down the road. But it's just sort of true, right? Like our love grows. We keep investing even if, even if the child is not showing the same kind of commitment to us. Our commitment to them is not wavering. It's a great analogy for what it's supposed to be like when we're married. Now, what does this have to do with what Jesus is talking about with sex? Well, here's the thing. Sex in marriage is a sign of what you're supposed to do with your whole life. So whether you want to talk about this in church or not, here's the reality. One of the most vulnerable, intimate things that you can experience with a person is to have, to have a sexual relationship with them. It's meant to be safe. It's meant to be intimate. It's the way that God designed it. But it's also meant to be a picture of saying, I give all of myself to you. I'm not hiding anything from you. Now, why would we hide? Because we don't feel safe, right? But that's what it's meant to be, a picture of you. And so Jesus is saying, in marriage, giving your body to someone is an expression of saying, I'm giving you all of me. But he's also saying this, when I give my body without that commitment to give all of me, I'm cheapening what he has given me. I'm cheapening what it's supposed to be. And so when we step outside of God's design, which he, for Jesus, it's sex in the context of marriage, what we're saying is this, I love the feeling I receive, but I don't want to give the commitment that comes with it. But here's the bigger thing. And this is what we don't catch because we get caught up on, but this is my identity and this feels good. Jesus is saying in that moment, you are using another and you are being used by another. And I know what you're thinking. No, that's, that's not it. I love this person. We're committed. Listen, you don't have to try to convince me. I'm not the one saying that. Jesus is saying that. Amen. I'm using this person and they are using me. And here's what Jesus says when he says, you've heard it said of old, you should not commit adultery. He's basically saying, hey, hey biblical sex be, means being willing to do with your life what you do with your body. We gotta keep, we gotta keep moving into this point because Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, you've heard that said, 
You should not commit adultery, but I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery in her heart. Now, last week I said anger happens, right? There are legitimate things in the world that we should be angry about. It just happens. It's a part of being human. Well, guess what? To, to notice beauty, to see another person and be attracted to that person and to experience some measure of desire in that attraction is to be human. So Jesus is not saying if you're married and you ever see an attractive person, you're like, man, they're really attractive. He's not saying you're going to hell. Loosen up, guys. It's okay. <laughs> That's not what he's saying. He's saying if you look with lustful intent. Well, what does he mean by that? He means if you look with the, the intent only to use that person for your own pleasure. If you look with the intent to possess that person. If you look with the intent to consume that person. So just like Jesus is not condemning being angry per se, he's condemning sustained anger or resentment. He is not condemning desire or attraction. He's condemning sustained lust, lingering lust, which is the idea. Again, it's the picture of objectifying a person seeing them only as a commodity for your own desires. Which means this, you can look at your spouse with lustful intent. And some of you are like, I thought that was the point. That was the whole point of getting married. Like I can now lust after this person because we're married. Well, not if you don't, under, not if you don't understand what Jesus is saying. Lustful intent is the desire, in, even in marriage, to consume or possess your spouse for your own needs, without regard for their wants, their desires, their dignity, their personhood. And if you carry that further, Jesus is clearly talking about sexuality, but you can carry that further into all kinds of other ways, right? All kinds of ways that we enter into relationship with people, not because we want to care well for them, but because we see them in a very mercenary way. I could use this relationship for my happiness, for my pleasure, for my joy. So if you love your spouse only for what they can do for you, not for who they are, Jesus is talking to you. If you love your coworkers only for what they can do for you, not for who they are, he's talking to you. If you love your child, only for what they can do for you and not for who they are. Jesus is talking to you. Now this word for lust, it's the same word in the Greek. When Matthew translates this, it's the same word as covet. So, so that's Exodus 20 verse 17, right? One of the 10 commandments, you shall not covet, right? Coveting is, is longing for something that we think that will make us happy that God has not been pleased to give us. And it's like, it's like looking to possess that thing that is of lesser value than God because we don't believe that God has our best interest at heart. We don't believe that God really cares about us at all. Coveting, what arises out of coveting? It, it, this, this idea that there, there is something other than God that can make me happy. Now think about this. What do you think's happening in that moment of lust? Like what, just process it. What are we really thinking in that moment? This will make me happy, right? I mean, that's really true of any sin, right? Any, any sin, it's like in the moment, what we're, thinking, what we're thinking is this will make me happy. This will satisfy me. That's why we move in that direction. But this idea of covetousness, again, thinking there's something that we have to have to make us happy, other than God, what does it do? It plants seeds of distrust and discontentment. We begin asking, well, if God, if God isn't going to give me this, does he really love me? Or we begin to justify it, right? This is where the psychology comes in. Well, I can't control the way I feel. I can't control what I'm looking at. And again, Jesus isn't just concerned with what we're doing outwardly. He's concerned about our heart's desires. Let me ask you a question. 
Do you think that most people who have an affair are having an affair because it's just about sex? Yeah, the answer is no. I'm sure there are occasions where it happens where it's just about sex, but for most people, there's something far deeper happening. I stumbled on, uh, a month ago, I stumbled upon um, a documentary on Netflix about Ashley Madison. You guys know about Ashley Madison? So Ashley Madison was a website, but it was a website for people that wanted to have an affair. So the tagline for Ashley Madison is, life is short, have an affair. Like that was the way that they promoted themselves. And Ashley Madison grew into a massive company. They had hundreds of thousands of accounts on Ashley Madison. So it was a, it was a dating website for married people. Hundreds of thousands. And I forgot what the year was, but there was a, there was a data breach on their account. It wasn't secure. And all of that information, like not just credit card information, like all of people's secrets, because you can imagine what people are talking about on a dating site that people aren't supposed to know about as you're sharing your fantasies, all of that information was released. Now, here's what was fascinating about the documentary. Two of the main stories in the documentary were by confessing Christians. So one of them was the wife of a pastor seminary professor whose information was released and he committed suicide because of all the the shame around what had happened and her story of her forgiveness extent to her husband is remarkable but the other story is a young man who marries kind of the girl of his dreams they build this life they're social influencers they have everything that they want and they start it's interesting the, the person in the documentary starts to press him why did you do this? He was a confessing Christian. Why did you do this? Were you unhappy in your marriage? No. Do you not love your wife? I love her. Were you not satisfied? No, we had a great marriage. We had a great sex life. We had great kids. Why did you do it? Because I just had this nagging feeling that there was, there was something else out there I needed to be happy. coveting, right? I mean, he had multiple affairs. He seems repentant. He's not the focal point of this story, but just illustrating what happens when we begin to covet a life different from the life that God has given us. And we hear these kind of stories and we're like, how, how could this happen? We hear Jesus's words. And we're like, I don't understand how people get here. Well, they get to that point because They start looking at something that God has said no to and they keep looking and they keep wanting and they keep desiring. And before you know it, you're the central figure on a documentary on Netflix. That probably won't be your story, but here's the thing. If you are in Christ and God loves you, what, if that's, if that's the secret stuff, it, it, it will surface. Because God loves you. Now here's what's interesting. Why does Jesus shift directly from carried anger, resentment, to lingering lust? And I think it's because they have a lot in common. Here's what they have in common. Anger and lust are both about, they're about two things, affirmation and power. Anger, resentment, and care, and lingering lust are about affirmation and power. Frederick Bruner in his commentary says this. He says, lust is like anger in that it seeks power over another. Both anger and lust put people down through seemingly opposite emotions by hatred and by desire. But the emotions of anger and lustful desire unite in their egoism, in the fact that they're about the, they're about the person expressing anger or lust and their enjoyment of power over people. People are used in both. Here's the thing. Carried anger, resentment is an attempt to prove to everybody and ourselves that we're right. I am justified to feel this way. Lingering lust is an attempt to prove to ourselves and to others that we're attractive, that we're matter, that we're desirable. That guy in the Netflix special, that's part of what he was after. Somebody would find me attractive. 
And both of those things, what does it reveal? It reveals deep insecurity in the life of the angry person or the lustful person. Now, here's the good news for you. And I don't want you to miss this because we can look at ourselves and say, oh, how insecure I am. I should feel shame for this. And we miss the fact that that insecurity is a reminder of how much we need Christ. And it is a reminder of his invitation. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Come to me, all you who are tired of being you, and I will give you rest. The beauty of the gospel. And then Jesus tells us, again, what's the danger? The danger of sustained lust, the danger of sustained anger is that it is that it's a gateway to hell. Now, Jesus is talking about Gehenna here. Gehenna was a place outside the city where they would burn all the trash, but it was a place that pictured unquenchable thirst and unfulfilled longing. And here's, here's the thing. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, hey, you, you can choose your own way. You can choose to say, sex my way on my terms it's going to lead to fulfillment. It's going to lead to affirmation. It's going to lead to happiness. It's going to lead to joy. And here's what Jesus says. He says, you're going to discover that it's going to promise you affirmation and fulfillment, but it's not going to satisfy you in the way that you think it will. I think it was C.S. Lewis who said this. Part of what makes hell hell is the fact that you will have eternal longings that can never be satisfied. And I think that gets to something about what Jesus is saying. And those of you who have struggled with lust, you kind of already know this. You're like, I, I'm just on this cycle. I, I can, I can, it's, it never satisfies me. And Jesus, again, he's like, and it's not enough that you just do the right thing outwardly. I'm after your heart. I want to change you from the inside out. So what is Jesus saying here? Well, he's certainly condemning all kinds of pornography. He's condemning the commercialization of the human body. He's, he's condemning the way that we treat people um, as things and tools and, 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 and as a transaction relationally. He's condemning all of those things. But more than that, it's not just about don't do this. He's pushing us in the direction to say, what I want for you is I want you to have a heart posture that honors others. I want you to have a heart posture that seeks to protect others. I want you to have a heart posture that really cares about the people that I have made and died to redeem. So how do we move from using to treasuring? Look at verse 29. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. Now, here's the thing I want you to, to catch about this, right? Because sometimes we're under the illusion that Jesus gives us words and he's like, this is easy, guys. Jesus wants us to understand that avoiding the second look, avoiding the willful look, avoiding the lingering look, avoiding the sustained gaze that objectifies a person, avoiding reducing people to tools for your fulfillment is a very difficult thing. Like, this is a very difficult obedience. He wants us to feel that. It's why he says, like, in order to navigate this part of life in ways that honor me, like, if you're struggling, gouge out your eye and cut off your hand. Like, those seem like pretty valuable commodities, right? They seem pretty important. So Jesus is telling us. He's not saying, like, you shouldn't hear what I'm saying today and be like, man, what Jesus just thinks, I should, he just thinks that dealing with lust is easy. He's saying the exact opposite. He's talking about how hard it is. He's talking about how hard it is not just to navigate sexual lust, but he's saying, look at how hard it is not to use people. How hard it is not to take advantage of people for your own End. And here's where Jesus' words is in total collision with what the world is teaching us, especially in the world of psychology, because psychology says we can't control these desires. And yet there are, so, there are countless testimonies of people who've walked with Jesus and honored their marriage and honored their spouse and countless testimonies of people who've managed to control their sexual desires. But what Jesus wants us to understand is, is if I'm gonna take this command seriously, that every attractive person in my life outside of my spouse is just revealing my fresh need for grace. 
So just like anger is an invitation to the way of Jesus, this is going to sound strange, but every time I feel a desire outside of God's boundaries, it's an invitation to the way of Jesus. It's an invitation to remember who Christ is and what he has done for us. It is a reminder of how badly we need a Savior and how much we need forgiveness. Which is also the beauty of gathering for the church every week. It's just this reminder. Jesus, I need to recenter my life on you. I need your help. I can't do this on my own. What is Jesus, when he says, gouge your eye out, cut off your hand, what is he saying? He is saying, you have to wage war on desires that will destroy you. You have to wage war on desires that are going to steal your joy in God. So Paul says it this way in Romans 8, 13. He says, for if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the spirit you put to to death the deeds of the body, you will live. What is Jesus saying? You have to take decisive action against these habits, against these things, against even people um, that though pleasurable and though it might seem like if I don't have this, I'm missing out on something indispensable for living. We have to take decisive action against the things that are in fact ruining our lives. Jesus doesn't offer a gradual path. He says, no, you need surgery. You need amputation. Now here's why it's hard. Here's why it's hard because we look at our life, we look at our world And we see something we want, and we feel like if we don't have it, we're going to be robbed of pleasure. We feel like if we don't have it, we're going to be robbed of purpose or companionship. And here, I'm going to tell you something that you're going to be surprised maybe to hear at church. You might be robbed of companionship. You might be robbed of pleasure. You might be robbed of the thing that you want. But here's what Jesus is saying. Gaining that and losing the kingdom isn't worth it. But that is so hard to see in the moment, right? It's just so hard to see. And again, Jesus, is, he's, like, he's like, and I get it, right? Better to limp into heaven than leap into hell. Augustine said, but he speaks of how difficult our world is. He says, it's impossible to keep the devil from shooting evil thoughts and lust into your heart. But see to it that you do not let such arrows stick there and take root, but tear them out and take them away. I think sometimes we, we're not surprised at the temptations, but we're just really, we're really comfortable making our homes around them and think that there won't be any consequence for that. As Jesus ends this, before we jump into two things of application, he is one of the few important figures in culture who protects the sexual side of marriage. Look at verses 31 and 32. He says this, It was also said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. So again, that command was given it's from Deuteronomy 24, Matthew 19, that command for divorce, that allowance was given because of the weakness of human flesh. Because sometimes we, we struggle to navigate well around things that hurt us so deeply. And Jesus said, so here's a concession. He says, you've heard it said that you'll get a certificate of divorce in that case. Verse 32, but I say to you, everyone who divorces his wife except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Jesus, there's, there are sermons that can be preached on what Jesus is saying here, okay? And I'm not gonna jump into all that Jesus is saying about marriage here. I think he's saying a couple of things just to highlight them. One, I think Jesus is highlighting the fact that, that a divorce occurs in a marriage when there's infidelity, not simply through a certificate of divorce, that the breaking of the marriage isn't the piece of paper, it's the act. Now, again, Jesus gives permission for divorce here. He's not mandating it, but he's just acknowledging that these things happen. I think Jesus is also, when he mentions this, he's also just highlighting how incredibly vulnerable we all are to sexual sin. What is he saying? He's saying, hey, if you get divorced, you're probably gonna wanna get remarried. And you need to think about You need to think about what that means before the Lord is what he's saying. I remember Jesus' world, divorce was just as rampant as it is in our world. But here's what I want you to see. I'm not going to get into all the ins and outs, the black and white of what he's saying. That's a whole other sermon. Why was divorce rampant? It was rampant because in Jesus' world, like our own, people were being objectified and discarded because they didn't meet the needs and the wants of their spouses. Now, divorce was sometimes happening because real things happened to break that. I'm not minimizing that. 
But here's what we have to understand when Jesus is saying these really high and holy words about marriage is that when, when there's a breaking of a marriage, there's a need for repentance on every side. And some of that repentance is not what you think it is. There's obvious sin that leads to the breaking of marriage, but here's, here's the repentance. Sometimes we need to repent just of our own weakness before the Lord that brings us to the place of saying, I need this separation. Does that make sense? Like some things are just so painful that we don't know how to navigate them. And we just have to acknowledge before God, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to stay in this place. And it leads to people separating at times, sometimes divorcing. And that is also something to own before the Lord, just like we own the sin that led to the separating. Does that make sense? And here's the good news of the gospel. The gospel is sufficient both for our sin and our culpability, but also for our weakness. Jesus sees marriage as a safe place, but here's the thing. We don't, we don't always experience that it's a safe place. Why? Because we don't always see the other the way that we're called to see them. So hear me, let me offer you just two words of application as we think about this message and how to apply it. The first is, I want to encourage you to cultivate the will to fight sinful sexual desires. Cultivate the will to fight sinful sexual desires. This is a really important question that I think that you need to ask yourself. And this question could apply actually to any struggle in your life. Because sometimes, here's the thing, sometimes we know what the Bible says. We know exactly what Jesus is telling us to do. And if we're honest, we just don't have the will to do it. And that is the moment of our greatest spiritual need, right? I know what I should do, but I don't have the will to do it. I don't want to do it. Like you read this text, it's so clear that Jesus is talking about the danger of sustained lust. He's talking about the danger of it to our souls. He's talking about, he says that pursuing sex outside of his boundaries will leave you unfulfilled and unsatisfied. He's saying that objectifying people is catastrophically damaging to others. Like science will tell you this, that people who are objectified, they experience body dissatisfaction. And it come, from that comes sexist beliefs and violence against people and a mindset for some people that the only way I could feel love is to be objectified. Like there's all kinds of damaging ramifications to what Jesus is saying here. But in a world where that says our desires are uncontrollable and a savior who says they must be resisted, we have to decide, do I have the appetite to take Jesus at his word? Do I have the appetite or the desire to fight decisively in the way that Jesus calls me to fight? And if you want to fight, how do you cultivate that desire? How do you cultivate that will, right? So here's what we know. Scripture, Romans tells us that obedience in our walk with Jesus is very important. But here's the thing. Obedience, just for the sake of obedience, is not a winning strategy against lust. And this is what I mean. Like doing all the right things and putting the filters on your phone or the internet or, you know, um, just staring at your feet when you walk down the street or you're at the beach, what, whatever. Like <laughs> obedience alone is not a winning strategy. I know that sounds strange. Let me explain. So Romans 14, 23, Paul says this, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So whatever we do, if we don't do it from a posture of faith, Paul says is what? It's sin. It's not honoring to the Lord. So any act of obedience, anything I do, any law keeping, box checking I do that does not spring from a heart of faith does not honor Jesus because it's just works righteousness. Now, there's a whole other sermon about whether or not we should keep doing that anyway because it's the right thing to do, but, but just keep tracking with me. In my relationship with Jesus, what's the goal? Is faith the goal or is obedience the goal? This feels like a trick question. It's faith. Why? Anything that does not proceed from faith is sin. Faith is the goal. Faith that God's ways are, will bear more fruit in my life than my ways, that's the goal. So, but here's the thing. If I have faith, what will follow? Obedience will follow. So how do I cultivate the will to fight? 
If I want to win against sin, particularly the sin of lust, I've got to work on my faith. Paul says, 1017 Romans, faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. How do I cultivate the will to fight sin? I have to build faith. What do I need to focus on to build my faith? Jesus. I have to focus on Jesus to build my faith. I have to focus on Christ. Know Christ. Delight in Christ. Meditate on Christ. Get, to, get the whole Jesus before my eyes. Because here's the thing. When I see Jesus for who he is, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the living water. If you eat this bread, you'll never be hungry. If you drink this water, you'll always be satisfied. So what's the point? The point is, if I get a right view of Jesus, Piper says, I get a right view of Jesus, then faith will rise up. If I get a right view of Jesus, faith will rise up. Grace will come through that faith and obedience will fall up. Where do you get the will to fight? Faith. Where do you build your faith? You got to look at Jesus, not everything else that you're looking at. Second word of application. This is really short. Give Jesus' concern in relationships priority over your perceived needs. Give Jesus' concern in relationships priority over your perceived needs. So if you read what we, if you look at last week's sermon on anger, what's Jesus' concern when we think about carrying anger and resentment? His concern is the impact of that on the other, right? That's what, it's, he's, that's what he's concerned about. He's concerned about the other. His teaching here about lust and sexuality, what is his concern? The impact of the way I see another person on that person. So my concern in relationships, most of the time, honest confession, is me. That's what I'm thinking about. Jesus says, no. So you got to flip it if you're going to be in the kingdom. In the kingdom, your concern has to be the other. So here's your homework. Here's your assignment for this week as you think about application. So in the New Testament, I think there are like 33 one another's in the New Testament. Humble yourself before one another. Love one another. Be kind to one another. Serve one another. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You're welcome, Ed. Um, So you got all of these one another's. That was a private joke between Ed and I. All of these one another's. How do you prioritize Jesus' concern for your relationships? You practice the one another's in the power of the Holy Spirit. And you do that by faith. You're, Jesus, help me to see people the way that you see them. Well, how am I going to start to see people the way Jesus wants me to see them? Well, I'm going to have to get in close proximity to them. And I'm going to have to interact with them. And I'm going to have to interact with them in ways that honor Jesus on days that I don't want to honor Jesus in my interaction with them. Because sometimes I don't want to humble myself before my wife or my children or my coworkers. Sometimes I don't want to submit to them. I want them to submit to me. Sometimes I don't want to be kind. I just want to be left alone. You guys, you can tease all this out on your own, but that's what it looks like to give priority to Jesus' concern in relationships over our perceived needs. Father in heaven, thank you for the word of Christ and for the precision of it and for the clarity of it. And Lord, I pray that um, you would cause what you want each individual here to hear, to, you would cause it to, to, to take root in the hearts of those who have heard. I pray that you would give them ears to hear and eyes to see. And Father, I pray that you would make us a people in our battle against objectifying others. Make us a people whose faith grows as we look at Jesus and that the fruit of looking at Jesus would be that it would change the way that we look at others. Lord, I don't know if anything else I could ask that you would do in us that would be more valuable than that, that the fruit of us looking at Jesus would be that it would change the way that we look at others. So I pray that you would make it so in our hearts and our lives. And Lord, all across this room, I'm sure there are people that feel discouraged or maybe they feel ashamed because there's not good fruit in the way that they look at others. And maybe that's, maybe there's revealing itself through lust. Maybe it's revealing itself through anger. Maybe it's revealing itself through cynicism or any number of things. Lord, as we sing this song of response, remind us 
that our hope is not in our righteousness, but in Christ alone, who is our righteousness. And by virtue of his righteousness at work in us, makes it possible to love the way that Jesus loved. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Will you stand with me as we sing a song of response?